Okay, hello. Thank you, Ignacio, um, for those uh, uh, very helpful words. Welcome, everyone. This is indeed the first in a year-long series. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Ian Ramsey Center and the Humane Philosophy Project. Um, I think most of you already know what the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion is. I'm just going to say a few words very briefly about what the Humane Philosophy Project is, uh, because you might not have heard of us yet. Um, so uh, the Humane Philosophy Project is a three-year uh, uh, long initiative. It's uh, based at the universities of Oxford and Warsaw, uh, and it's supported by Blackfriars Hall University of Oxford, the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion, Oxford, uh, and by the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. Uh, we began with a pilot event in 2013. We had another conference this summer and we have uh, uh, this seminar series this year in Oxford. We've had several events in Warsaw as well, uh, uh, paralleling those that are going on here. Uh, so this project was founded by Mikawai and myself. However, there are two other current organizers. That's uh, Jonathan Price of the University of Leiden and uh, Chemek Burstika of the University of Warsaw. Uh, and the point of the, the project is to promote and to engage in humane philosophy. Now, what we mean by that in essence, I think, is philosophy that tries to address human concerns. Uh, and that means philosophy which is, for one thing, in touch with broader human culture, and that includes both of the two cultures we sometimes distinguish, that of the arts and humanities on one side and that of the sciences on the other. And it also means philosophy which is willing uh, to pursue big questions, the, the important questions which matter to us the most. Uh, this might be contrasted, perhaps, with the uh, somewhat fragmented and highly specialized and indeed highly technical kind of philosophy, which tends to have been prevalent for the last uh, uh, few decades. Uh, so humane philosophy might be seen as something which would complement philosophy of that kind. So the idea that a philosophy of this kind is important and worthwhile is not a new one. Uh, I think it was there in uh, the writing of the Croce translator, Douglas Ainsley, when he said, empirical science in collusion with positivism has stolen the cloak of philosophy and must be made to give it back. And it was also there when A.J. Eyre said in his inaugural lecture, uh, I believe as Wickham Professor of Logic here, that uh, the extreme generality of a question should not be seen as a reason for treating it with suspicion, but as a reason for pursuing it. And it also appears in many more recent papers and talks, some of which can be found by visiting our website, humanephilosophy.com, which we have up behind us on the board of a moment, and I hope you will uh, visit it. You'll be able to see the footage of the talks here and footage from previous events that we've organized. Um, so hopefully this thread, Humane Philosophy, will be one you'll be able to discern throughout the seminar series this year, uh, talks which are engaged with these two cultures, the sciences on the one hand and the arts and humanities on the other, and which attempt at least to address some of the big and important questions which are uh, uh, of primary concern to us. I'll now hand over to my colleague Mikwai sofkowski Roda from the University of Warsaw to, to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. Thanks, Ralph. Um, um, I'll, I'll take my place here for two reasons. One, so that um, in order to give the floor uh, to our speaker tonight, I can yield the floor. Um, and secondly, to set up the PowerPoint that uh, Ralph mentioned. Um, so it is my very great honor to welcome our first speaker of this year's seminar uh, series that we do collaboratively with the Ian Ramsey Center, and indeed the new director of the Ian Ramsey Center, um, Professor Alice de McGrath. Um, who, among uh, his many other roles, um, is also the new Adrius uh, Professor of Science and Religion at the University of Oxford, um, a senior research fellow at Harris Manchester, president of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and uh, also serves as the associate priest in a group of uh, Church of England village parishes uh, in the Cotswolds. Um, which I was uh, uh, extremely intrigued to find out. Um, so, uh, Professor McGrath uh, began his uh, academic career, in fact, as a scientist. Um, 
doing research in chemistry and, and molecular biophysics, um, leading to the publication of a number of uh, uh, peer-reviewed research articles. Um, and alongside this research, um, he uh, uh, studied at um, the final hour university in Oxford um, for a degree uh, in theology. Um, and subsequently, from uh, so early on, um, the interaction of Christian theology and the natural sciences uh, has been a major theme uh, in Professor McGrath's work. However, apart uh, from the relationship between uh, science and religion, um, uh, Professor McGrath's very wide-ranging interests also include historical theology, systematic theology, uh, as well as apologetics. Um, and his writings include, among many others, the introduction to Christian theology, an introduction to science and religion, uh, Institutia Dei, a history of the Christian doctrine of justification, and perhaps my favorite pair, if you can treat this as a pair, a history uh, um, uh, uh, of defending the truth, heresy, uh, and why go God won't go away, uh, engaging with the new atheism. Uh, and Professor McGrath's most recent publications include uh, a very widely acclaimed biography of C.S. Lewis uh, and a book on Swiss theologian Emil Brunner. And Professor McGrath's talk this evening um, will um, very much uh, um, be concerned with the relationship between science and religion um, and will perhaps give a perspective um, on the fragmentation of our view of the world expressed uh, by the relations of the academic disciplines we have developed for studying it, um, which Ralph implied in his introduction um, to what humane philosophy is about. So please give a very, very warm welcome uh, to Professor Alistair McGrath. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and be able to speak on um, this theme I've mapped out in um, the lecture title, The Search for Coherence, because it's a very broad issue in human existence. It, it's scientific, it's philosophical, it's cultural, and clearly it's religious as well. And what I hope to do in this lecture is to map out some areas of discussion. Um, I'll be highlighting some areas where I think there's some things we need to say, but in many ways this lecture is really aimed at setting a framework to enable you to take this discussion further. So what I hope I'll be able to do is map out some areas of discussion, map out some themes that I think you'll find interesting, but it's really to try and get you to take this conversation further. And the question I want to begin by asking is why, why does coherence matter? Why is it important? And I think there are a number of answers we might be able to give. One of them is that it was very important in the past. And many of you will, will know uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, famous writings on the Middle Ages. And Lewis was very clear that whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, uh, leading writers of the Middle Ages had this very coherent way of thinking that wove together science, religion, philosophy, ethics. There was this deep sense of an ontological structuring to the created order which affected the way in which we thought, the way in which we behaved, and you were very conscious of being part of a bigger whole. And Lewis saw that especially in Dante, but of course you can see easily how that can be extended to other writers as well. And Lewis's title, The Discarded Image, I think reflects very well his perception that this has been lost, that somehow in moving into the modern period, we've lost that sense. Because certainly in the Middle Ages, if you look at the models of nature that are used, they're very often organic models. Nature is a living reality. It's something which is significant, which is living, which is woven together. And the models of nature that are used during the Middle Ages very often embody this idea of coherence. Things hang together. And Lewis's worry, which I'm going to be addressing in this lecture, is that I think we've lost at least something of that sense of coherence. And what I want to do really is to reflect with you on whether that is indeed true, and if it is true, what we might do to begin to bring things back together again. And so I want to suggest that in many ways a point of transition can be seen in the 16th century, when a lot of things are happening. I mention here 
the ferment that's going on, religious ferment, you know, the, the unity of the body of Christ in Western Europe is broken. What was once coherent becomes incoherent. And Protestantism, which is initially seen as being a single movement, very quickly fragments into a number of them. But it's not simply religious. If you look at um, deeper issues, you'll see that this process of fragmentation is really beginning to happen at every level. And that's why I thought it was very good to put this quote up from John Donne. Um, Donne is very, very clear in his later poems, ones that date from the beginning of the 17th century, that he is living at a time when what he thought as a younger man is no longer being taken seriously. And there is this sense that a coherent way of thinking is just falling to pieces in front of his eyes for a number of reasons. And um, he describes them as being times that are out of joint. He uses the image of a labyrinth to describe the idea of coherence. But really, it's this line in the 1611 poem, The Anatomy of the World, that I want to, in effect, suggest is a very fitting motto for this lecture. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. And what Dunn is really saying is, he's saying, look, this is about the world. This is about how we see the world. It's about how we represent the world. It is atomized. It's fragmented. What was once a unified structure is falling to pieces in front of our eyes. Now, um, I was very kindly introduced as having done some research in the natural sciences here in Oxford, which is true. And I did the, the, that research in the Department of Biochemistry, which w was that seven-story building in the science area. And those of you who've um, been unfortunate enough to wander near the science area in recent months will know that that building is simply disappearing. And it's been taken to bits one story at a time. But I don't, I think, felt something like that, that there was a solid structure a way of looking at things which just seems to be crumbling. And I think there are two things. One is this deep sense of nostalgia for a past age in which things seem to hang together where you knew where you were. And at a new and unknown age when things seem to be falling to bits and it's not entirely clear what is going to emerge once those bits are put back together again, if indeed they are put back together again at all. And interestingly, if, if I had time, I would make the point that actually you see this kind of imagery, the image of buildings falling, of ruins, also in another poem, which is very much about, you know, an age of coherence passing and being replaced or something else. And that, of course, is T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. You know, think of the image of ruination that dominates that poem. <coughs> So what I want to do is begin to flag up what's going on. Going back to Lewis, Lewis argues that one of the great things about the Middle Ages was it had this very strong sense of the need for an arche. Now, you might want to use a different word there. What Lewis is getting at is uh, what I described there as a, a narrative or theory that colligates and coordinates our experience and observation of the world. And the point that Lewis is trying to make is, look, we have these individual observations and experiences, but we believe they are part of a greater whole rather than simply fragmented bits and pieces, which we experience individually precisely because they are just bits and pieces and there is no bigger picture into which they fit. And um, Lewis, of course, very much admired the Middle Ages. Um, and this quote from his book, The Allegory of Love, I think summarizes up very well what Lewis saw in the Middle Ages and what he believes that we have lost in the modern period. He writes, medieval art achieves or attains a unity of the highest order because it embraces the greatest diversity of subordinated detail. Now, I like that sentence. I think it's very well constructed. But look at the ideas. What Lewis is saying is, look, you have this idea of a, a, a meta-narrative, which is able to hold things together, which is able to give you a point of focus so that things are seen to be part of a greater whole, not simply individual, dislocated 
disconnected entities. And Lewis's worry is that we've lost this sense. Now, he may be right, he may be wrong, and Lewis also thinks we need to try and re-achieve it. And again, you may want to challenge him on that. But certainly Lewis is very, very clear that this Renaissance vision of intellectual unity actually is rather important and needs to be rediscovered. Now, in some ways, you might say, well, of course, professionally, academically, this is really about trying to achieve some degree of interdisciplinarity. In other words, trying to be able to hold together, as was mentioned earlier, the humanities and the sciences. I think that's difficult. I think it's difficult for a number of reasons. I don't think there's anything wrong with this vision. I think the difficulty is its implementation today is very, very difficult simply because of the massive inflation of the literature in every field imaginable, with the result that you know, people tend to focus not simply on a broad area, the humanities, literature, but very often on a single author, something like that which means, in effect, we lose something of that breadth of vision. But Dunn, I think, needs to be located historically. And basically, um, Dunn clearly felt he was existing in a transitional age. Again, his phrase, a time that is out of joint. And maybe one of the things that's worrying Dunn, maybe one of the things that's worrying Lewis, is this sense of standing between a settled and stable period and a potentially unknown and unsettling future. Now, I suspect there are many here tonight who will say, well, look, actually, isn't this the characteristic of every age? Doesn't everyone feel like this, especially as you get old, when you feel the, the certainties of your youth are being replaced by something really awful, which you don't quite understand, but which everyone else does seem to understand. But I think Dunn is getting at something deeper. Um, we can, I think, begin to point to a number of ages when this sense of coherence, incoherence is perhaps maximalized. I would suggest that Augustine of Hippo is a very good example. You know, the Roman Empire is crumbling. It is not clear what is going to replace it. And Augustine, in many ways, is trying to lay the intellectual foundations for the... For the permanence of Christianity, even if the social structures in which it was then embedded are beginning to fall to pieces. And uh, it seems to me these lines from Matthew Arnold really capture this very, very well. Those of you who've read the full poem, which is actually quite long, will know that Arnold imagines himself up uh, in the Alps, looking down at the Grande Chartreuse, and thinking, you know, you know, that is an image of a past age when things were a lot easier and everything is changing. Their faith is no longer our faith. And what is the faith of the future going to be? He doesn't know. And so he says, look, I'm wandering between two worlds, one dead, the other powerless to be born with nowhere yet to rest my head. And I see that in Dunn. You know, Dunn is saying, look, there's a past I knew, there's this future I, I don't really know, and I have no idea where I fit into this. And this sense of incoherence, I think, is really important for him. Now, you might argue, um, I say might because a case could be made, but the case could easily be unmade if you accentuate different aspects of it, that things began to return to some degree of coherence as a result of the work of Isaac Newton. What do I mean by that? Well, one of Newton's great achievements was to show that seemingly disparate phenomena, the motions of the planets around the sun, <coughs> the falling of an apple, were actually part of the same picture. They might seem to be quite distinct, but when all was said and done, they really were parts of that same picture. And of course, you might think of Pope's very famous uh, epitaph for Newton, nature and nature's laws, they hid a night, God said, let Newton be, and all was light. And of course, the point being made is that Newton restored this sense of coherence. He did so at a price, as I'll explain in a moment, but Newton's rather mechanical way of thinking about the universe did allow you to say, look, there is a bigger picture, and you can understand these individual aspects as being part 
of a bigger whole. And this idea of explanatory unification, which as many of you know becomes, I think, very important in the natural sciences in about the 1990s, is there even in Newton. But in the end, the vision failed, and it failed, I think, for a number of reasons. One was that Newton offered a very mechanical model of the universe, which you know, clearly had advantages, but it lacked that it lacked something that was there in the medieval models, which emphasized interconnectedness. And the idea of the universe as a mechanism really led to the idea of a disenchanted universe. And it lies behind that line in Keats, uh, his poem Lamia, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But in effect, what, what Keats is worried about is, is that science is, science is destroying the coherence of nature and in effect reducing it to what he describes as a dull catalogue of common things. Its special nature, its special character is beginning to disappear. And Max Weber, of course, you know, coins this phrase disenchantment. Now, it's a very complex phrase, but really it's saying is, look, the world can be reduced to forces, to numbers, to interconnections. There's no sense of this greater picture, of this sense of there being something special about nature as a whole, because you are investigating the various components of nature, and by looking at the, the trees, you fail to see the wood. There's more to it than that, but I think that highlights the point of importance. And of course, there's a lot of anxiety about the growing realization that Newton's celestial mechanics weren't actually quite as straightforward as people had thought. And the reaction of the, against this model of the world as machine, romantic poets thought this is just depersonalizing. We've lost something that's magical, something that's very, very special about the nature of the world itself. And you might think of, um, you know, Coleridge's phrase of Newton's God being sheathed in steel, you know, it's a very, very unpleasant image. This, for those of you who don't recognize it, is a still from Charlie Chaplin's film, Modern Times. And, you know, in many ways you would say this film is, um, is representing an unease that many had about the mechanical view of the universe. It, in effect, is about depersonalization, that human beings are simply trapped within a vast machine, losing their identity. And obviously, I don't want to single out any particular part in particular, but you might like to focus on this unfortunate person, because in effect, the message, the message of the movie is we are trapped in a machine. What we thought was going to be liberating ends up trapping us and in effect eating us up. So there are a lot of interesting questions there. And to give you an example of what I have in mind, which I think helps us bring together both science and humanities, we might just look at the image of a rainbow. I've hinted this already by um, quoting from Keats, the dull catalog of common things, but I think I'd like to work this further because it is very important. What is a rainbow? Well, at one level, it is an optical phenomenon. It involves the refraction of white light, uh, and, and it certainly is that. In his poem, Lamia, Keats is saying, the problem is, the writers of my day are saying, it's just that. You know, it is purely an optical phenomenon, and it has lost its rich, its rich semiotic field, if you like, its ability to signify, its ability to be a thing of beauty. And what Keats is really worried about is a whole lot of things that used to hang together to be part of the same thing are just falling to pieces in front of his eyes. And you could easily say that he's exaggerating, he's misunderstanding what the scientific enterprise is all about. But what Keats is saying is that something that was held together is actually fragmenting into its components and as a result is being impoverished. And there is the line from Namia I have in mind. And you know, what he is saying really is, look, um, using the rainbow as an example, 
I'm making the point that things go much wider than this. You know, in effect, you have something that inspires all. I mean, basically, Keats is using this word in a, in a stronger sense than we might. Something that inspired all basically is simply reduced to an optical phenomenon. It's dull. It's a common thing. It's lost that special character. And of course, um, Keats here is not talking about you know, philosophy as a discipline we might know it. It's really natural philosophy, which Keats is saying basically robs nature of its special character. And he goes on, you know, philosophy will clip an angel's wing. It's a beautiful phrase, you know, something that was meant to raise us upwards as a, as a sign of the transcendent instead brings us down because it's a sign of a simply optical phenomenon. Uh, conquer all mysteries by rule and line, in other words, by, by measurement. You know, one of the key themes in Max Weber's idea of disenchantment. Empty the haunted air and gnomed mine, unweave a rainbow. So Keats is really worried. He's saying we're losing something right now because science is in effect dissecting nature by cold logic and by doing so is robbing nature of its imaginative appeal, something much deeper which is meant to be there. Now you might say, well, you know, perhaps, perhaps um, this is an exaggeration. I want to suggest that it might be, but on the other hand, there seem to be some very legitimate concerns being expressed. And what Keats is saying is that there is, there's an issue here about the the scientific method being used to say it's this and it's only this. And you can see a similar concern in Goethe, but the point I want to make is that there is a risk that science, which, with which I have no difficulties at all, becomes scientism. Uh, a ghastly word, by which I mean something like only what science is able to tell us. In other words, instead of saying science tells us part of the picture, and that's really good, now we supplement this using the humanities, using religion. We simply say science is saying that's it, folks, and that's it. And Kant is, uh, Keats is really worried about this at this stage. And in particular, he's concerned that this dissection of natural beauty, in effect, leads something that was once seen as something coherent, being reduced simply to its component parts, which are understood to be disconnected and unrelated. It's about fragmentation of vision. So that's the concern, I think. So obviously, I've raised this concern. And what I need to do, I think, is illustrate that it's broader than simply the issue of the aesthetic appreciation of nature. So I'm going to talk about um, two papers from Nancy Cartwright. One's a book, one, one's a very recent paper. Some of you will have read her book, The Dappled World. And this paper here, you can get online very, very easily. You can read it. Um, clearly, um, the people who've typeset this second paper, when you look at the typeset version, they, they haven't heard of apostrophes of any kind. Uh, and and it, it will cause you some concern at one or two points. Um, however, let's stand back and ask, what is the concern? And basically, I think the, um, each of the titles conveys what she is saying and believes to be right. The imagery of a dappled world. Basically, look, there are all these little bits. Aren't they nice? But they are little disconnected bits. There's no big picture. There are these little bits here and there, and you can't put them together into a coherent whole. She's talking about the laws of nature, and she takes the view that the laws of nature are actually rather less universal and robust than we might like to think. But that's not the point I want to focus on. It's more this idea that our observations of nature are observations of aspects of nature and do not necessarily disclose a greater whole at all. We see bits and fragments, and we may say there's a bigger whole behind these, but that's us. 
And that's the point she's making in this paper as well. Basically, that in um, the old days, people would say, well, there is an undergirding order of nature, which is grounded in the nature of God. Then we'd move away from that, and we'd say there's an undergirding order, which we impose on nature. And then we begin to say, actually, there isn't any undergirding order at all. And we've got to face up to that. And so that imagery of fragmentation, I think, is very, very central to this whole theme. So staying with um, Nancy Cartwright, I mean, one, one of the things she is saying is that she, she thinks her scientific colleagues, for various reasons, may have exaggerated the validity, the universality of laws of nature. And in particular, she focuses on um, biology and argues that biological laws, I think we have to put those in inverted commas, are rather less robust, rather less universal, and rather more contingent than you might think. And again, it's part of this picture of saying, look, it's a fragmented picture. We don't have this universal sense. We have particulars, we have contingencies, but we lack this sense of a unified vision that we once have. So thinking about the coherency issue, I mean, C.S. Lewis is, is a very good example of someone who says, look, there is a coherency there, even if we don't actually discern it. And so talking about the scientific method, he writes this. We are not reading rationality into an irrational universe, but are responding to a rationality with which the universe has always been saturated. And Lewis takes the view that that's what the scientists he knows are doing, but actually he's really echoing the co consensus of the Middle Ages, that in some way um, the logos of God as creator is seen in the rationality of the created order. Whereas Nancy Cartwright is saying something very different, that we are imposing order or rationality, where actually there, there, isn't, there isn't any. The rationality comes from us, it's us projecting, not us discerning something that is already there in the natural world. And therefore, Nancy Cartwright says we can only offer multiple accounts of the natural world and its structures, which means we have fragmentation. She does not concede that these multiple accounts may somehow be unified. They are multiple because they are different. So I want to suggest to you this issue of coherence is still there as something that's significant. And so what I want to do is then to ask this question. How can we begin to reaffirm, or maybe I should say reassert, coherence? And I want to explore a number of possibilities with you, basically to map out the territory and kind of give you an opportunity to see what, what you would want to say in response to this issue. And clearly, the central issue is that. Is incoherence a perception, or is it the reality? For those of you who, just, who don't follow this, the point I'm trying to make is that as we look at the world, we may gain a sense that there's, there are all these things happening, they're not connected at all. Is that our perception, reflecting limitations on, on the scope of our vision, or is that the way things really are? In other words, which is the perception and which is the reality, coherence or incoherence? And I think that we can begin to develop this in some quite helpful way. This is a phrase I borrowed from William Hewell in the 1830s. He uses the imagery of colligation, by which he means tying things together. And he uses this rather nice image of threading pearls on strings. He's saying, look, we need to find the thread that holds things together. Huell was very clear in his own mind that um, there was a fundamental interconnectedness of things, and if you found the thread that held them together, that gave you your theory. Now, is he right? Or do we need to think of micro-theories rather than <coughs> macro-theories? But of course, what we are doing, I think, is really looking for a big picture of things. And so I've borrowed here from Eugene Wigner's very famous uh, paper of 1960, The Unreasonable Effectiveness 
of mathematics, which I'm sure some of you will have read. And you will know then that um, he says really that science, mathematics, is the search for the ultimate truth, which he defines as, uh, and there's a quote from him, I'm afraid that um, this whole thing is a quote. The quote marks start there and the end there. He's talking about a picture which is a consistent fusion into a single unit of the little pictures. And his argument is that there has to be a big theory, a big picture, which holds together the little pictures. And therefore, we are looking for that big picture, for that grand theory, which is able to bring together all the little theories. And of course, those of you who are up to date with um, string theory will know that, you know, that, this, that M theory really tries to hold these together in a coherent whole, even though I think some of us would want to raise questions about how successful that actually is. So how does religion come into this? I'm going to suggest to you that religion actually does many things. And if I had to mention two words that seem to me to be very important about religion in this context, they would be intelligibility and coherence. Uh, some of you will want to say, well, actually, there's more that needs to be said, and you're right. But for our purposes tonight, it's not just about making sense of things. It's about saying there is this deeper coherence, which is grounded in God, grounded in creation, and grounded perhaps also in us bearing God's image. So we might think of Colossians 1.17, a very rich text, which talks about Christ being before all things and that in him all things hold together. Now, it's a very rich phrase, and New Testament scholars will, you know, talk endlessly about what he means by that. But the theme of giving coherence, holding together, is one of the themes they explore. I want to suggest to you that's important. And again, you can connect this with Lewis, although I'm really more interested in Colossians than Lewis here. But Lewis clearly is really saying, look, maybe there is a failure on our part to appreciate something that really is there. So, you know, we might think of various ways of thinking about things, and here is a rather uninteresting picture, but it does, I think, give us a very powerful sense of the compartmentalization, which is very characteristic of our ways of thinking today. You know, there's this little box, I mean, this might be um, humanities, and this might be philosophy, and that might be theology, and that might be mathematics, and that might be, you know, you can go on like this. And the key point is they are disconnected. You know, they don't talk to each other. It's very much, you know, there's a philosopher's perspective. I'm not interested in talking to anybody else. You know, it is about fragmentation by compartmentalization in sealed, non-interactive compartments. I want to suggest to you that A, that is happening, and B, it's not a good thing. That's why I think these seminars are actually very, very helpful. They give us a chance to talk about these things and ask, is there anything we can do about it? As opposed to that, you might think of a spider's web. And it's a very, very well-worn model. I apologize for those of you who are tired of hearing phrases like a web of meaning and things like that. But one of the things that this brings out very, very clearly is the idea of interconnectedness. I want to emphasize two aspects of that. Number one, the fact that things hang together. That actually it's not about uh, you know, this being philosophy, this being theology. Actually, you can trace a thread of, of connection right throughout the whole thing. But secondly, and this is the point I think I really want you to remember, in this web, connection is about strength. What gives the web its strength is the fact that there are all these threads of silk which connect up with each other and give it that added strength. And I want to suggest to you that a coherent vision of reality is much deeper, much richer, much more robust, 
much more aesthetically satisfying, much more intellectually engaging than the rather impoverished account that you find with any one mode of analysis. And that's why I think it's very important to begin to look at this. And I offer you here some starting points. And again, these are simply me throwing ideas at you and saying, as I think about these problems, here are what I think might be some helpful starting points in our discussion. But I must emphasize I'm not saying we're limited to what I think. I'm saying I'm simply giving you these as a starter, a sort of opening salvo of the discussion, if you like. There's more I know that can be said. One is to rediscover the idea that religious faith is not just about commitment, although, of course, I concede immediately it's that, but actually it's a way of seeing things, you know, a, a theoria, uh, which basically enables us to see what might seem to be incoherent as a coherence, not as an act of self-deception, but as an act of deeper perception, which sees beneath the surface of things. Secondly, I want to emphasize the need for multiple mental maps if we are to grasp the complexity of reality. And the point I'm making here is that if we only use one angle of gaze or one particular approach, we will end up with a superficial account of what is clearly a deep and complex reality. And also, I think, a critical realist epistemology which recognizes that reality is complex. There are different levels. And we can engage this level in this way, this level in this way, but the deepest and richest and best picture of reality is going to be the one that weaves as many threads together. Or to use another image, you know, we need a very rich palette of colors if we are to do justice to the beauty, the, the, you know, the, the complexity of reality as we experience it. And those seem to me to be helpful ways of beginning to open this up. Now, C.S. Lewis was absolutely convinced of the coherence of things and saw his Christian faith as a way of both recognizing and affirming this. Lewis is very given to using what you might call ocular or, or illuminationist ways of thinking, and you can see this very, very clearly in this quotation. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And the point is that he saw his faith as illuminating a mental landscape so that what seemed to be fragmented is properly seen to be interconnected, like some kind of a mental landscape. Or well, yes, there are individual landmarks, but they are connected in some way by roads or by rivers. And Lewis, I think, really um, uses a number of images. I think this one, a panorama which enfolds and positions individual snapshots, is a very good way of thinking. The danger, and John Donne was saying, is we have lots of little pictures of bits of the world. What we need is a big picture which is able to include all of those snapshots. In other words, it's about comprehensiveness, but which also allows us to position those snapshots so we can see how they relate to each other. And so you might think of this panorama as quite a nice one. This is a Swiss Alpine Meadow in May. Um, and you might look at that and say, isn't that nice? And what you might do is, is try and break it down into its components. You know, look at some nice flowers. Oh, look, there's some peaks. Oh, some trees. Oh, some clouds. You know, and the point is that, that those are all part of it, but none of them are good enough in itself to convey and communicate what that landscape looks like. Lewis is saying we need to find some way of being able to bring all these things together rather than simply present them as individual aspects. An idea of multiple maps is helpful, and I like Mary Midgley's uh, recent writings on this theme, where she uses what I think is quite a helpful image, which is that of looking into an aquarium through different parts of the glass. You see different things, but actually it's all part 
of the overall picture. If we insist here at the end that our own window is the only one worth looking through, we'll not get very far. And Mary Midgley is not simply talking about different perspectives on reality. She's talking about bringing different methodologies to bear on the investigation of reality in order to give that bigger picture. So we might also think about critical realism, as I touched earlier, which is the idea that we need to think about reality as being fundamentally unified but stratified, and that in some way we're trying to hold together different levels of explanation. And most of you will be very, very familiar with this idea, though you may not use this vocabulary to describe it. Basically, it's saying, look, with a complex reality, there are different dimensions to this. And we've got to make sure that each of those is woven into our discussion. So how do we hold these together? Well, I want to suggest that actually science of religion is a special case, but it's a paradigmatic case. Because in many ways, science and religion are two of the biggest and most important aspects of our postmodern culture. And being able to get them to talk to each other and enrich their visions seems to me to be almost like paradigmatic of a greater need to do this far more widely. <coughs> and certainly it's very, very easy to put artificial barriers in which leads to these perceptions of incoherence. But I also want to say it doesn't have to be like that. And in particular, I want to suggest that one of the things that religion does is to provide this deeper framework for actually positioning the natural sciences. Natural sciences raise questions that lie beyond the capacity to answer. Uh, theology is able to explain A, why the natural sciences work, and B, give um, perhaps only partially grasped answers, but answers nonetheless to some of those deeper questions. I thought it might be nice to end with this quote from William Inge, uh, who um, at the time of writing that particular book in 1910 was Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity at Cambridge and went on to be Dean of St Paul's Cathedral in London. And the point he's making is that you need a canvas, you need a frame through which to view reality which asserts its coherence. And I think he, he writes rather well, rationalism he says, tries to find a place for God in his picture of the world. But God can't be fit into a diagram. He is rather the canvas on which the picture is painted or the frame in which it's set. And I think that's helpful. I think it really, I'll go back so you can see it again. It really is just saying, look, maybe our challenge is to find frameworks of meaning that leads to rediscover and reaffirm coherence. And maybe modernity has lost that framework, but it's not lost forever. Maybe there are methodologies of retrieval which will allow us to put these things back together again. Yes, tis all in pieces, as Dunn said, but actually maybe there are frameworks of meaning which can put things back together again. I don't know whether you think I'm right or not, but one of the reasons for giving this talk tonight is to say, A, this is really quite an important issue, and B, it's worth talking about this. And that really brings us to the next part of this evening's agenda, which is opening us up for much wider discussion. I, I am happy to answer questions, but I think, given the quality of some of the people here tonight, it might be good to make it a discussion rather than a Q&A session. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions if you want me to, but I think it would also be very, very good if there are points you want to make that move the discussion on. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for listening. And if I fail to convey to you knowledge by description of humane philosophy at the beginning, you now will have knowledge by acquaintance. Uh, I think Nella is just going to take the microphone at the back.
uh, when you ask a question or make a point that's contributing to discussion, we'd be very grateful if you wait until the microphone got to you. You won't hear your voice any louder. It's so that it uh, uh, will be picked up for the footage of the seminar, which will then go online. As Ignacio said, if you say anything you'd like to edit out, then, then that can of course be done. So I think if people raise their hands who have something to say or something to ask, uh, uh, we can proceed. Okay, I think the lady at the front here was the first. The microphone is just behind you. Um, quite, quite a lot of the time, especially when you were talking about um, perception of reality, I was thinking of a piece of music and the notes on the page. Those notes on the page, I'm not a musician, but they're distinct and separate. But, you know, what, what a wonderful sound the orchestra makes. What we know about that, but I think it's almost arrogant to assume that we can ever know that much about God himself. So that's just a point, really. No, it's a point that I would feel very much in agreement with. And also, I mean, the imagery you use is very, very powerful. In the Renaissance in particular, um, the image of musical harmony is very often used to talk about coherence. You know, there are individual notes, but they come together to give harmonious chords. And it's that sense, you know, that, that you can respect individual aspects, but you can also respect the, the bigger picture that actually arises from them as well. Thank you. I think Stephen Priest. Yeah. Um, I'm very sympathetic. To you just use the microphone so that it does. I'm very sympathetic to the picture that you've drawn of the history of ideas from the Middle Ages till now, and I think it would be um, intellectually enriching and spiritually enriching to have a holistic picture that integrates disparate ways of viewing the world. Now, coming from philosophy, it seems to me that um, philosophy since the 18th century has been increasingly anti-metaphysical through the writings of Hume and Kant and Nietzsche and uh, the logical positivists, later Wittgenstein and so on. There are various uh, arguments against, in a way, doing philosophy or against uh, the possibility of raising really fundamental questions about the universe and the possibility of the universe, which would give us these uh, meaning pictures or candidates for a holistic picture of, uh, of uh, reality. But if we go back earlier than uh, Hume and Locke and so on, or, or even con slightly contemporary with uh, Locke, Leibniz, Spinoza, and um, uh, Descartes in a different kind of way, they do have holistic pictures or pictures of reality as a whole that we could uh, draw upon. And those world pictures entail the existence of God. Ultimately, or ultimate being, is, constra is, is construed as uh, God. On those pictures, God is the ground of the world that holds everything together. So, uh, if that, I mean, but I'm, having said all, all that, hopefully in a positivist, in, in a positive uh, vein, Cut out the positive. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think that, that, that there are some grounds for, for pessimism. People who write in academic philosophy and try to uh, rehabilitate metaphysics or try to say that philosophical questions ultimately have theological answers tend not to be read uh, very, very much. Uh, overwhelmingly, the flavour of <coughs> modern academic philosophy is more or less science, scientism, or there's a tacit positivism, a tacit assumption that all genuine explanation is scientific explanation. Now, I think we have to, we have to ask the question, well, well why is uh, that? And in particular, why historically is there this enormous fragmentation of uh, views and, and lack of holism? And I agree with your tracing it to the end of the Middle Ages and the emergence of the Renaissance and Reformation and all that. But in the last 30 years, I think that liberalism has become the ideology of global capitalism. We live in a, we live in a global capitalist era, not just in the, in, the rest, in, in the West, but increasingly worldwide. And although the media would have us believe that some sort of conservatism the ideology of global capitalism. Actually, liberalism is the ideology of global capitalism. Now, global capitalism, in effect, enforces liberalism, extreme liberalism through, through education, through the media, and, and so on. And that 
enforces the fragmentation of worldviews. If, if, if each society is going to be replaced by a multicultural society, that's the enforcement of fragmentation. Now, so there's ground for pessimism about your ambition uh, there, or global capitalism and the liberalism of this ideology stands massively in the way of the McGough uh, project. But I'd say that global capitalism, as we know it, has been a product of finance and of the industry of iron and steel and so on, and we don't yet know what the information age is going to bring or what's concerned with ecology is going to uh, bring. Good, thank you very much. If we have any comments on it, I, I don't know if you want to. Well, I think, well, I'm very happy with what you said. I think one, one thing I would just add, which is that actually, I think one of the things I notice is that very often this, this attempt to secure coherence is done at the individual level. It's much more difficult. I think you're absolutely right to do this at a corporate level or a, a sort of national or communal level. Thank you. I believe they did the, yeah. uh, While you're talking about the transition uh, issue, I couldn't stop thinking about what Christ always underline now is important so maybe the present from the point of view of time how time comes into this picture uh, maybe to st the concern for present uh, might unify the picture in a way and also it's important what you just said earlier um, there are few level tool at least, um, where we can speak about uh, coherence and incoherence uh, and fragmentation, uh, individual and collective. And I think if we find a way for each individual to be, to feel whole in itself, herself, himself, um, it might help us to connect better to the big, uh, bigger picture and there are small, maybe small ways, apparently I have I published an article on how people can um, become whole again through the media of icons because this was my, it's my expertise, so I could. So if everyone knows in their own uh, area somehow about this and cooperate in a kind of team enterprise, maybe something can be done at least on the, I'm not sure about society in general, but in communities and things, and maybe that is a start. I, I think the emphasis on the now is very important because for a lot of people, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just where they are. It's, it's very important and they have this feeling that things are falling to pieces and they want to figure out either how can my society put things back together again, or if they can't, how can I personally try and put things back together again. As a, as a sense, something I want to do now. So I think there, there's something in that. There's a, there's a real pressure. The historical examples I gave help us see that you know, this has been the way people felt down the ages. Maybe they felt it more acutely at certain times. But actually, I think, I think it's a general human perception, particularly as you get to the point where you remember the past and you can sense that the future is going to be very, very different and you're wondering, well, where do I fit into this? Okay. Worried about the future. We always, we are always anxious because I, I think everyone experienced that. What will happen tomorrow? But uh, we'll see. I mean, you see, what important? It's important what we are doing now, right now, because that might build the future. And this, anyway, it's not point in worrying because you can't do anything about okay. it. Okay. Thank you very much. We have a surprise at the back. Michael Hawking. Question for you, Professor McGrath. Uh, it seems to me that there are a lot of people in the academy, particularly in the sciences, who are poorly equipped to even have these conversations, having only ever studied the sciences. Um, and so, I wonder if if conversations between certain disciplines, I'm a little bit, sometimes I'm skeptical about how fruitful they can be if people don't have a, fr a broader framework in which to have these conversations. And so, I'm wondering. Uh, if, if, maybe, if maybe the formation has to happen earlier in the university, if you could comment on maybe what, what we could do within the university to help to promote this. If that's our goal and people are poorly equipped to do it, people who have already been trained, I'm wondering if maybe you could comment on what you think we could do earlier in, in, in academic training and in formation to better equip people to help to solve this problem. I think if you're 
background is the humanities. You, you're given a rich body of literature and actually quite a good language to be able to um, understand what's going on and express what's going on, also think about what you might do. I think if you're a scientist, um, I think you still think thoughts like this. But trying to put them into words is not quite that straightforward because you perhaps don't have access to the same range of images and languages that a humanities person might have. But I will tell you, scientists do have thoughts like this. Um, but they, they might not express them in quite this way. And I'd like to think that, that the humanities might help them, A, be able to articulate this more fully, but B, also perhaps might, might give them some sort of framework to try and resolve them. But I, I think my, my basic conviction is that the only thing that is going to really resolve this is a, a way of seeing things, a way of looking at things, which actually enables you to say there is some deeper coherence to things here, which is grounded not in my imagination, but in the way things really are, even though I only see that picture partially and grasp it imperfectly. I think that actually is existentially quite good for you because it enables you to cope with what are often very complex situations by saying, look, that there's, something, there's something deeper here which I don't quite understand. I can cope with this and I'm going to go forward. And of course, the classic example of, of a feeling of incoherence is the existential despair that many people feel as a result of suffering, you know, where they feel there's something Something out of sync here. This isn't quite the way things should be. But very often they feel there's a bigger picture which enables them to cope with this, where otherwise they might not be able to at all. So I think there's a lot in what you're saying. Thank you. I'm going to use the privilege of a chair to make a comment of my own, which was very similar to Michael's point then. I suppose one of the difficulties, perhaps, is that in humanities departments, we can get away with holding seminars on this kind of uh, topic because we can uh, kind of uh, uh, plausibly claim that this is uh, part of philosophy or part of theology or part of whatever it is we're doing. However, we probably couldn't get away with claiming that we're doing theoretical physics here or, or any specialized scientific subject, perhaps not any broader scientific subject. And so that means that these discussions are more likely within the academy to come out of the humanities faculties, not necessarily because we're the only people interested in them, but because we're the only people who can get away with it. <laughs> like, maybe, perhaps. Brother Matthew, perhaps. Thank you. I wholeheartedly applaud and support your project for coherence, and I just wonder if there might be um, a difficulty, an ultimate difficulty, in that we're trying to see things um, but this seeing will include a kind of unseeing. Now, this would take us into the, the uh, mystics, perhaps, especially of the Christian tradition. The theoria um, ultimately has to be a kind of numinous, uh, numinal experience. The awful rainbow um, reminded me of C.S. Lewis's thing, I think it's at the start of The Abolition of Man, where he's describing a waterfall yes. and, and saying, you know, this is awesome, and that's not just saying anything scientific. Um, now, if that's the case, our holistic, coherent picture will include a kind of wonderment and amazement at the magic of reality, which can't ultimately be expressed in words. If it were to be expressible, then we would have to have God's own view of reality, the, the view sub specie et tenitatis, for example, from, from all eternity. Um, and our minds haven't evolved to, to, to be capable of this, which is a point I think that Stephen Pinker makes elsewhere. Um, so both from the scientific side, someone like Pinker and his concerns for evolution, and from the religious side with the mystical tradition, we can actually agree on our inability for certain ultimate comprehension, except through a kind of faith, which, which is trying to... Um, accept and work from an ultimate point of view at the same time as building up the, the panorama from below. Um, but how do you bridge that except by a kind of faith? And, and then what is that faith going to mean? And how can we be confident in it? Um, that's the, the no, I, th I think that's a very good point. And, and I think 
you know, whatever analysis you offer of nature, you're doing so as a matter of faith because nature is not telling you. You're, you're trying to figure it out. And I think that what you can say, taking up the points you've made, are first of all, that um, there is no way that we are able to do justice to the complexity and beauty of nature or of God. And in fact, our attempts to do so very often diminish it because we, we, we think we fully understood and we haven't. And by thinking we fully understood it, we limit it to what we have understood. And so saying something like, I only stand, understand this in part, there is yet more, but that what I do grasp is actually rather good. You know, that's, that's, that's actually, that's about a sort of um, postponement of full encounter, but saying that the, what I have now is actually enough to be going on. But you, you're quite right that actually it's not just that discerning deeper patterns is a matter of faith. It's that faith is about discerning deeper patterns anyway. Uh, and that um, one, of the, one of the reasons why I think religious faith is so important is that it gives you the ability to comp cope with a very complex reality by saying, despite all appearances, there is something here of which I am part and of which I can be part and therefore I'm going to get on with it, rather than feeling you're overwhelmed and bewildered by it, and, and you kind of go and shut the door and climb into a stove somewhere and, and, and hope that will sort out all the problems. So I, I think that, you know, that there are some possibilities here, but the point you make is a good one, that we in effect um, deceive ourselves that our grasp of things is the way things are. No, it's not. I mean, it's partial. It's inadequate. But actually, it, 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 it's enough to keep us going but we need to bear in mind that there's an awful lot more that needs to be said. And indeed, you could argue that part of the, the growth you experience in the life of faith is actually seeing the curtain drawn slightly more, going deeper into something that might otherwise be the case. Thank you. There's a gentleman at the front here, and then I'll just go back to the next one. Thank you. One uh, really historical dimension <coughs> One thing, of course, about the breakdown of coherence in the 16th and 17th centuries, one thing we have to bear in mind here is this yet flood tide of new data hitting Europe in geography, in astronomy, in geomagnetism, in medicine, and so on. And so that had to be made sense of. Also, too, I wonder how far individual temperament actually inclines one in certain ways of thinking. For instance, I was thinking as you were speaking, Galileo, for instance, uh, Robert Hooke, William Herschel, uh, the great anatomist uh, Thomas Willis, and even Eddington in our own time, or relatively own time, were very much wrestling with new data, yet were also men of remarkable Christian faith, and didn't seem to see the problem in the more and more minute and minute structures of nature and how they fit it together. In fact, instead of being phased by it, they gloried in it. And the idea that the more bits we find and the more we try to make sense of, the greater is God and the more wonderful is our imagination. So I wonder how far this element also of temperament even lets us into it. I think there's two very good points. Taking the second point first, I mean, as I look at, I, I don't know all of the figures you mentioned, but certainly the ones I do know, what I see is this prior conviction there is coherence. So when, when they discover more, it's the amplification of, of a solidified vision. So they feel we're enriched rather than we're swamped you know, and hence confused. And I think going back to your first point, is a very fair point, is, I mean, one of the reasons why the Renaissance ideal of universal knowledge collapsed is this massive inflation of knowledge, which meant that, you know, no one person could cope. And so people are feeling, you know, lost. And so one of the reasons why this fragmentation takes place is people feel they have to specialize because they can't cope with the whole thing. And, you know, it, I can understand that entirely, but I, part of me just wishes that somehow we could try and hold things together a bit more. As a, as a biologist, I'm seeing things from the, my narrow aquarium Mary Misley point of view. I was delighted that one of the previous questioners um, produced the mortal sin in a philosophy discussion of mentioning the word evolution. Evolution is a coherent 
idea, which has post-dated most of the quotations you've given, which together with the American discovery of nutrient cycling and energy flow in the 1970s, provided, provides a very coherent view of nature into which religion has to be fitted. So then the question becomes, why do many humans feel pleasure at seeing a waterfall or a rainbow? And what's the evolutionary advantage of a, a system belief, um, many of which exist in the world? What advantage is it to a human to have such a system of belief? And one can see a lot of these ideas in relation to the fact that evolution has occurred. And this provides a coherence, which to some extent has resulted in, in the fragmentation of philosophical ideas because modern philosophers don't really know how to deal with it. Well, thank you for that point. I mean, I know there are some very interesting issues being raised there. And I, I, I agree with you that evolution is um, a relatively coherent way of looking at things. I'm not sure how much it explains, but it certainly offers us challenges to think about things in greater ways. Why do we appreciate beauty? I mean, in one way, you have, to, you have to link this to survival value. Now, you, you might go with one line of thought, which says, well, the appreciation of beauty in other human beings might be an evolutionary adaptation, because if somebody is beautiful, the chances are they are healthy, and therefore mating with them will lead to better offspring than somebody who is not you know, well, I mean, you can see how a line of argument might go. Yeah. But that doesn't help us understand waterfalls. And I remember having a very interesting discussion with a friend of mine who is um, a, a, a sort of um, evolutionary psychologist, saying, well, of course, uh, one of the reasons that we exult so much in, in, in landscapes is that we came from Africa and we're kind of reminding ourselves of where we came from. And I, I said to him, look, you know, I, I love the Alps. And I'm not quite sure we came from the Alps. <laughs> you know? But I, I think, you know, the, let me tell you what my, my problem is. My problem is that part of me says, I think there's some very good questions being asked here. Part of me also feels that there's a real evidential dearth. You know, there's just not evidence, enough evidence available to let us fill in the gaps as to what actually has happened. And therefore, some of these approaches are a little bit hypothetical. Um, why do you like music? Uh, well, I mean, one of my friends says, well, it's because um, music enables you to march to battle more effectively, and therefore you will win the battle. Uh, and um, you know, maybe that's part of the picture. But I have to say, I don't think it's all that big part of the picture. I think there's something else there. I think, I think the, the approach you're ra raising rightly you know, does open up a lot of questions, but I'm not sure it always gives us the answers to them. But it's good to ask those questions. I, I'd like to make a... Oh, well, there is someone. Well, I'll still make mine very quickly and then you can back. I just wanted to add, because it's on the point of evolution, it seems to me, presumably one might argue that although the theory of evolution in, in itself uh, is a theory of very great coherence, if you use it to explain how attitudes or beliefs that we continue to possess came about, then it seems to me that you end up with a great deal of decoherence, because on the one hand we have all these attitudes and beliefs, and on the other hand, we have this internally coherent theory that tells us they came about, they came about through processes which are epistemically arbitrary, with have, which have little to do with them being appropriate attitudes or true beliefs. And so that isn't to count against the plausibility of the theory of evolution, but it uh, does suggest that that's a theory that throws up just the kind of challenges to coherence, perhaps, that, that Professor McGrath uh, began by talking about. Um, right Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering because we can have this discussion among academics who, if not religious, are at least open to the idea uh, of God. But in the wider society, the turning away from metaphysics obviously was connected also with the so-called death of God. Do you see any space in which we could try to recover, or at least help people to recover coherence without necessarily assuming they are religious? Because it's very hard to convince someone into faith. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. And um, let me tell you what I think, but I must warn you, it might be wrong, OK? Um, what I think is there are a lot of people who would say, 
Um, this idea of, of seeking for a bigger, better vision that gives you coherence is actually modernist. And we've moved beyond that. We're postmodern now. We're quite happy to have individual local pictures, welcome fragmentation, and live with that. And I, I think that really the issue for me is um, how one can show that the quest for coherence fits into a postmodern way of thinking. I, my own feeling is you can use Stanley Fish to do this. But that would take quite a long time to explain. Uh, so I'm just going to have to say, I think his idea of interpretive communities gives you a way in to that, which I think might work quite well. But you're, you're right, you know, if you don't have a kind of religious framework, your options are a bit limited, uh, because you're, you're, you're looking for something bigger. And we live in an age which says, well, bigger pictures are probably wrong, or they're probably just deceiving. You know, little pictures are the best we can hope, you know, and therefore... Um, willingness to live with incoherence is seen by some people as an intellectual virtue. I personally think that, that you can challenge that and move it off in a very different direction, but it would take me quite a long time to explain how I think it could be done. But my, my, my answer really is that the simplest way of doing it is, is ultimately religious, because it, it just gives you this, this very unusual combination of cognitive and existential dimensions which actually enable you not simply to, um, to be able to grasp something, but actually to be able to live within that framework as well. Thank you. Okay, well, um, if I could just have a much to go on Ignacio's command. Okay, um, well, well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Do stick around, have a little more wine. We'll kick you out shortly after that. Um, but if we could just uh, thank Professor McGrath once again for a fascinating talk and for some really good discussion as well. Um, thank you.